Hey, good morning, Zion Hill. Good to see you. Let's stand together as we sing. Praise is rising, eyes are turning to you. Return to you. Hope is stirring, hearts are When we see you, we find strength to face the day. And in your presence, all our fears are washed away, washed away. and grateful, God, for the freedom that we have to come into your house to worship you this morning. In all things that we do, may you be glorified, may you be lifted up, because you're worthy in Christ's name. Amen. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Father, let your kingdom come. 
Father, let your will be done on earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Give us this day our daily bread, forgive us, forgive us, as we forgive the ones who sin against us, forgive them. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Let your kingdom come, Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done, on earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us, forgive us. As we forgive the ones who sinned against us. Forgive them. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Let your kingdom come. It's yours, it's yours, all yours, all yours. The kingdom, the power, the glory are yours. It's yours, it's yours, all yours, all yours, forever and ever. The kingdom is yours, it's yours, it's yours, all yours, all yours. The kingdom, the power, the glory are yours. It's yours, it's yours, all yours, all yours, forever and ever, the kingdom is yours. Father, let your kingdom come, Father, let your will be done, on earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Why would I worry? Giants come calling my name. My God is so much bigger than troubles I face. Why would I hunger for power, riches, or fame? My God is so much better than all of these things. I won't be shaken. I won't be moved. My God is faithful. His promise is true. So I speak to the mountains, oh, it's time to move. My God is bigger, better, stronger, greater than you. My enemies scatter, because they know the battle is done. My God is stronger, the victory is already won. 
died for my ransom and rose up on the third day. My God is greater than death, hell and the grave. I won't be shaken. I won't be moved. My God is faithful. His promise is true. So I speak to the mountains Oh, it's time to move My God is bigger, better, stronger, greater than There's no mountain too high There's no valley too low There's no fear that I have doesn't already know there's no problem to fit there's no weapon too strong there is nothing for God that's impossible there's no mountain too high there's no valley too low there's no fear that I have he doesn't already know there's no problem to fit there's no weapon too strong there is nothing for God that's impossible I won't be shaken And I won't be moved My God is faithful His promise is true So I speak to the mountain Oh, it's time to move. My God is bigger, better, stronger, greater, bigger, better, stronger, greater, bigger, better, stronger, greater than you. Amen. You can be seated. Well, good morning, everyone. Good to see you here this morning. I'm going to ask our men to come as we prepare to take up our uh, offering this morning. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for um, your goodness to us and for your power and the victory you've given us. And Lord, we want to see uh, your kingdom come uh, on earth just as it is in heaven. And we know that that kingdom exists right now in the hearts of people who have trusted and followed Christ. And so, Lord, all that we do today and all that we do in our lives, we want it to be about expanding, advancing the kingdom of Jesus. And so, Lord, part of that is the money we give. And so I pray that you would use this money to, to glorify yourself and to use it to, to minister to people and to reach people across the globe for the gospel. And so, God, uh, bless each one who's able to give, multiply it, and use it for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Can you sing with us? I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, oh, my soul. Joy. 
have a Bible, I'll encourage you to take it out and turn in it to the book of Psalms and turn to Psalm 136, Psalm 136, and we're going to read, in just a moment, we're going to read the, um, the first verse of that psalm, but we'll look at the entire psalm as we continue to think about and talk about our, um, <clears throat> we continue to think about and talk about our study and thinking of thanksgiving and being thankful and giving thanks to the Lord, which is what we'll talk about today. And I want to talk to you really last week and this week and next week are all about why it is we should be thankful to God. And the reason that we're going to talk about today is because God is good. Because God is good. I'm glad you said that. I'm glad you said that because that's the way I wanted to begin was to, uh, really it kind of fits with the psalm because there's a thing that we Christians sometimes say, and if you're not aware of this, it's okay. It doesn't make you less of a Christian. But uh, certain churches have done it and, and there's a handful of people in here, but we will say God is good. All the time. It's like a response that we kind of say. Um, and <clears throat> it's a, a little chorus or a sp- response or a saying that we say to really remind ourselves of the goodness of God. A lot of times we say it uh, when things are going bad. And um, someone recently was talking to me about some struggles they were having. But then he responded at the end of the conversation, he said, but God is good. And I said, all the time. And then he was walking away and he said, all the time. And I said, God is good. This is a way to remind ourselves of the goodness of God. But we also say it to not only to remind ourselves of that, but we, we say it uh, when things are really good and we experience the goodness firsthand and we're just thankful and we just say, God is good. And somebody will say all the time and all the time God is good. And that's fitting for this psalm because what you have in this psalm is that same sentiment, is that same idea. And really that is the main truth of this psalm. And it repeats it over and over. Really, it repeats this one phrase that we see in verse 1 and all the way to verse 26 It's this idea of God being good and his faithful love endures forever. So look in Psalm 136, verse 1. We'll read that. And then we will go through each section of this psalm to talk about reasons why and how it is God is expressing his goodness to us. So it says in Psalm 136, verse number 1, it says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good His faithful love endures forever. This is a, uh, really, the the Psalms are the songs of Israel. And they are actually, it's kind of a literal response during a liturgy or a service of worship. That every time the writer would read these one lines in verse 2 and then in verse 3 and verse 4. Every time he would go down and read another line. The the whole congregation would then respond with his faithful love endures forever. And then he would give another reason in his faithful love. It it was just a way for them to respond in worship. Now, I'm not going to have you do that today. But I want you to be aware of that because this is this response that this church or that these people of God are giving to to these truths about God's goodness. And so what we see here is the main idea is that we should give thanks to God because he is good and his faithful love endures forever. Now, when we talk about the goodness of God, we don't define God by our concept of goodness. What we think is good, we don't say, 
you know, in, in terms of we think something's good, and so then we think of God as in good, because what happens is if God does something outside of our concept of goodness, then we no longer think God is good. So we don't define God by our concept of goodness. We define goodness by how God has revealed himself through the things he has done. And the, what, what God's goodness is revealed in is it tells us that it's revealed over and over in his faithful love. Do you see that in uh, really every verse? His faithful love endures forever. That faithful love is a very prominent, important Hebrew word. It's the word hesed. Hesed, or if you want to be literal, chesed. Okay, And it's this difficult, in fact, depending on the translation you have, will depend on the difference in the way it's translated. And it's difficult to translate because it's so nuanced. And one of the translations would be uh, love. It would be translated as mercy, as kindness. Some of your translations will say loving kindness. Some translations will say loyal love, faithful love, covenant loyalty. All of those are aspects and nuances of that one Hebrew word. And I think the best translation actually comes from the children's storybook Bible. The children's storybook Bible translates this word or describes it this way. It is God's never stopping, never giving up, unbreaking, always, and forever love. It is this love that God shows in a covenant a loyal covenant faithful relationship to his people where he acts mercifully on their behalf. That's what that word means. And so what God does in this psalm through this writer is to show us his goodness through his faithful love. And that's really what the rest of this psalm is about is is how it is God is showing his goodness through his faithful love. And I'm hoping that as we look at each one of these sections that dis- express the faithful love of God, that it will stir your affection for God that will result in thanksgiving. Okay? All right. So the first way that God shows his goodness is God's goodness is revealed in who he is. Okay? So look in verses 1 through 3. And I'm not going to read every, I may not read every response there, uh, but, but just know that after every line and every verse, there is that response, his faithful love endures forever. It says, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, his faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. And then verse 3, give thanks to the Lord of lords. Now, there are three titles or names for God in these first three verses. There is the word Lord in verse 1, which is all capital letters, L-O-R-D. Then there is the name God in verse 2. And then in verse 3, there is the other name Lord, capital L, lowercase o-r-d. Those are three different and distinct names of God. So the capital L-O-R-D, all caps, is the name that we would pronounce or say as Yahweh or Jehovah. And that is God's personal covenant name. It's the name that God reveals to Moses whenever Moses asks the Lord, whenever God sends him to Egypt and to Pharaoh, and Moses says, who am I supposed to tell Pharaoh? Who am I supposed to say sent me? And God responds with, I am who I am. And that is translated as uh, the, that's a translation of that name, Yahweh or Jehovah. And it's this covenant name that God reveals to his people. And he's saying that to reveal himself as a, as a God, a personal God of covenant grace. He is the God, the God who invites you into a personal relationship with himself. Then there's the the name God, which is the generic term for God, which is Elohim. And it's talking about that that is the name that's used in Genesis 1 to refer to the God who created all things. 
And so he is the God of power, this God of creation. He is powerful unlike any other God. That's why it says he is the God of gods. Of all the so-called gods, he is the God above all so-called gods. And then there is the word Lord, capital L, lowercase o-r-d, which is the word Adonai. And Adonai simply means master. He is the one who is sovereign and in control of everything. He has ultimate authority over everything. So God is revealing himself as the one who is in control, who is all-powerful, and yet invites you into a personal relationship with him. That is one way God expresses his goodness in inviting us into this relationship. Can you just think about the privilege for just a moment? Just think about the privilege it is that the God of the universe invites you to know him. The second second expression of his goodness is God's goodness is revealed in creation. So look in verse 4. It says, he alone does great wonders. Verse 5, it says, he made the heavens skillfully, or uh, another way to say that would be with wisdom or understanding. The idea there with wisdom and understanding is uh, is the idea of skill. The word wisdom in the Hebrew Bible actually means the idea of skill. It's not only knowing something, but it's knowing what to do with the knowledge. It's an understanding of how to how to do things and put things together. So when you work with wisdom, it's an understanding of how you know how to do certain things, not just know certain things, but knowledge put into practice. And God has a skill and a knowledge and a wisdom unlike any other to be able to put the world together. We can't, we can't figure out the world, and yet God knows it intricately. It says in verse number 6, he spread the land on the waters. Verse 7, he made the great lights. Verse 8, the sun to rule by day, and the moon and the stars to rule by night. So the psalmist is looking back to Genesis chapter 1, and he points to God's creative work as a demonstration of his, as his goodness and faithful love. Creation is an act of divine love. It is God expressing his love. Now these verses look at the first four days of creation, And each part of this creation, each part of these days, is an expression of God's never-ending covenant love with his people. And here's why. Because because of that, we can say that God created the world with people in mind. Now, he did not create the world, or he did not create the world for us as if we were the purpose, because the purpose of creation is God's glory. But he did create the world for our enjoyment. And so, listen, God is inviting you to delight in the things that he has made and to delight in him as their maker. What God provided in creation was an environment for people to live in the delight and the joy of God's goodness. I think I told you a couple of weeks ago, We drove up to Indian Boundary. Uh, The peak time for the fall colors. And in fact, we went that weekend. And then I think two days later, they were pretty much all gone. It it might have rained. And that's how it happens, right? They, They peak and then it's gone. But that moment and being able... Now listen, that moment in going up there and seeing all of these fall colors or to feel the chill in the air this morning. I love it. I love it. To feel that, okay, is an environment God has put us in to be able to enjoy his goodness. Or some of you are like, I'd rather feel the 85 degree sun. That's fine. Because when you feel it and you feel the sun on your face or the wind blowing on your face or you experience the colors or whatever it might be, you're experiencing and being able to enjoy the goodness of God in his creation. He's put you in an environment for people to live in, to delight and joy in his goodness. But not only that, God's goodness is also revealed in his salvation. So look in verse number 10. It says, He struck the firstborn of the Egyptians and brought Israel out from among them with a strong hand and an outstretched arm. He divided the Red Sea and led Israel through, but hurled Pharaoh and his army into the Red Sea. Now, he's going back now. 
He's moved on past Genesis 1. Now he's moving to the Exodus. And you remember the story how he's talking about the deliverance of Israel. Israel for 400 years was in uh, captivity and, uh, and slavery in Egypt. And God sent Moses to deliver them. And the way that God convinced Pharaoh to let Israel go was that he sent 10 plagues on Egypt. And the last plague was the death of all the firstborn in the land. Even Israel would have gotten caught up in the death of the firstborn, but God gave them a way to be delivered. He said, sacrifice a lamb, take some of the blood, and spread it on your doorway of your home. And when the death angel comes through the land, if he sees the blood, he will pass over you, which is where they get the term Passover, okay, which he talks about here, the idea of this Passover. And so whenever the firstborn were killed, Pharaoh had had enough after 10 plagues, I guess so, and then that was the last straw. And he says, get out of my sight, and they all leave, and then Pharaoh changes his mind as they're on their way. And you've, Israel comes up and, in fact, is led, not just wanders there, but is led right to the place of the Red Sea. They are led to a place to where they cannot move forward. So the only thing to do is to go back, and God says, don't go back. When they turn around, you see the Egyptian army chasing them. And God tells Moses to move forward. Moses is like, where am I supposed to go? God says, move forward, and he moved forward. He put his staff in the water, and God spread the waters of the Red Sea so that the entire nation of Israel, a couple million people probably, were walking across on dry ground. And then when they got through, Pharaoh and his army tried to follow, and God shut the waters back, destroying the Egyptians and completely delivering Israel. This was such a huge event. Imagine if you experienced that. It was their, they regarded it as their salvation, their deliverance. And they come back to it over and over and over again. When they think about the goodness of God, they're thinking about how God delivered them in that time. And they're reminding their children and their grandchildren, we were there when God delivered us from the Egyptians with the Passover and the Red Sea. As this expression of God's rescue and deliverance their salvation, and God expressed his goodness in salvation, but then it continued on. God's goodness is revealed not only in his salvation, but also in his guidance and his provision. So they move on from there, and they begin to go toward the promised land, the land God had promised to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and they're moving through the wilderness. And we pick up in verse 16, it says, He led his people in the wilderness. He struck down great kings. And slaughtered famous kings, Sihon, king of the Amorites, and Og, king of Bashan, and gave their land as an inheritance, an inheritance to Israel, his servant. He remembered us in our humiliation and rescued us from our foes. So he led Israel after that Red Sea event. He led them through the wilderness, which was, when we say wilderness, we're not talking about a big wooded mountainous area. We're talking about desert. There's nothing there. And he led him through this desert wilderness toward the land he had promised. And as he does, he provides for them and he guides them. He gives them guidance, food, water, leadership, healing, and victory. Now listen, he gave them guidance with, you remember, if you know the stories, the pillar of cloud in the day, and then the pillar of fire by night, I think about the, the young uh, kid that got, um, he, he thought that his Sunday school teacher taught him this, and his mom asked, what did you learn in Sunday school? She said, we learned about Lot's wife, and remember Lot's wife, when she was leaving uh, Sodom, she turned around, she saw the destruction, and God turned her into a pillar of salt. You remember that? Okay, well, this, this kid got it wrong, and he said that Lot's wife was a, we learned that she was a pillar of salt by day and a ball of fire by night. It's kind of mixing the stories a little bit. God led Israel with the pillar of cloud in the day and the pillar of fire by night. He was leading them, but then he gave them food. Remember, in the middle of the wilderness, there was manna, 
bread from heaven, and quail. And he provided that manna, by the way, the entire journey. Every morning, except for Saturday morning, he would, deli- he would provide manna. When they woke up, it was just all over the ground. They, all they had to do was go collect it. He provided water. He led Moses, by the way, to a rock and told Moses, if you'll hit this rock, water will come out. But he also took them to a place where the waters were bitter, and he taught them and led them to, to make the waters not bitter, to where they were able to be drunk. He gave them leadership. He established Moses and Aaron as the leaders. He gave them healing. Now think about this. Israel rebelled against God in the wilderness, and God sent snakes, venomous snakes, in the camp to bite the people. And when they prayed, when Moses interceded, God told him to make a standard, a bronze serpent, to set in the middle of the camp, And he sat it there, and anybody who came to look at the bronze serpent was healed of their venom bites, of their snake bites. Which was a picture, by the way, of Jesus, who said that just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, referring to his own death, so that those who would believe in him might be saved. So God brought healing to them as they expressed their faith in what God had done for them. But then God gave them victory. He mentions two victories here. Victories over certain kings. Two Amorite kings here. The king Sihon and the king Og. You don't have to know that. Just know that as Israel's traveling through the wilderness, they have to go through other people's land. And as they're going through other people's land, uh, some of them were favorable, but some of them were not. Sihon was the king of the Amorites who would not allow Israel to pass through on their way to the promised land. He actually fought against Israel, but God delivered Israel from him and then gave their land to, gave his land to them. And then you have Og, baby name, in case you're wondering. (laughs) Og was another Amorite king who was traveling, uh, who was there and would not allow Israel to travel through. And he fought against Israel, but God delivered them on their way through. So God is giving them these victories, okay? But then, notice as he ends the psalm, verse 25, it says, He gives food to every creature. So what the psalmist is doing is he's looking back in the past to say, here's the expressions of God's faithful love and his goodness in the past. But I want you to know that it's not just about what God did in the past but what, about what God is doing right now. He changes from a past tense to a present tense. He did this, he did that, but God gives food to every creature. He cares for every creature. Now listen, God is good to you and me in the same areas That he was good to Israel. I want you to think about it for a minute. He's good to you in the environment that he's placed you in. In the environments that he's placed you in. Think about your family. Your work. You're like, (laughs) God's been good to me at work. The fact that he gave you work. But maybe you have a good situation at work. Or your friendships, or your church. As uh, the other night we were at a basketball game, um, our life right now is in the gym. We were in the gym another night and uh, watching our boys play basketball. Looked over and watching our daughter play with some friends. And I told, I leaned over to Steph and I said, They have no idea how good they have life how great their life is. And then I thought to myself, not only do they have a great life, I've got a great life. I mean, I can honestly say I have a great family, great marriage, and I'm not bragging or boasting. I'm just wanting to say I'm thanking God for it. Okay. Good, good experience, like just 
good relationships in family. And I'm thankful for the family. And maybe, maybe you can't say, maybe you don't have a good family experience. But think about um, other areas of your life. I, I think about, you know, like Wednesday, last Wednesday, after we got done with prayer and Bible study, I, uh, instead of going to the men's Bible study, I uh, walked around and saw everything else that was going on on Wednesday. And I saw all the people and all the things going on. I, saw, I went in there and I saw the kids singing Christmas songs. I think about 20-something of them, right, singing Christmas songs. Saw a host of youth at the end come down and start playing basketball or tag or whatever it is they play. And you think about even how many of the youth have been baptized recently. And you think about uh, the men's and women's groups that were meeting. Um, And not only were they meeting, but they had a, a good number in there and there were new faces in there. And even during the prayer time, whenever we were getting together, we, we meet for 30 minutes in here and we pray and we do a short devotion. And I know some of you think that that's not a big deal. Like, you know, you're not going to come for 30 minutes or whatever. But that blessed my heart Wednesday. To be able to pray together. To have people I can share my needs with and to pray together. And then just get in God's word for a few minutes to just see one truth that he wants to say to us. That we can thank him for, that we can apply to our lives. And that's what we do. We look at one truth, we apply it to our lives, and then we go and we say we want to try to live it out the rest of the week. Until we get to Sunday and we get back here and get another shot in the arm, we want to live for Jesus like this way. I'm telling you, it blessed my heart and was so encouraging to me. And I said to myself, I'm thankful for my church. And and when I say my church, I don't mean the church that I pastor. I mean the church that I'm a part of, that I'm a member of. I'm just thankful for these ways, these environments God has put in my life. And if you think about it, you've got some of those environments too your family or your work relationships or your friendships or even maybe your church, and you could just say thank you to the Lord. But he's also not only been good in the environment that he's given you, but he's also been good in the salvation he's given you. Just think about this, the conviction that God has given to you. Some of you think that you're afraid of the conviction of God, and I want you to know that the conviction God gives you about sin is a part of the goodness of God for you. Because God in that conviction is showing you something in your life that is making your life miserable. And it is his way of getting your attention to draw you to himself. A life of everything that you need and want in that moment. Deep down, God is leading you to it as he's drawing you away from sin and toward himself. You think about forgiveness that he's given. God has been good to forgive you. He doesn't have to do that. But yet he does, out of his goodness, he forgives us. Aren't you thankful for forgiveness? You think about the revelation of truth that he gives. We would never know Jesus was the way unless God opened our eyes to see that. We'd never know what his word says unless the Spirit opened our eyes and our hearts and our minds to be able to understand the truth that he's given. You think about the Spirit that has come in and sealed you for heaven. You have been sealed with the Holy Spirit. That's what Ephesians 1 says. Whenever you got saved, the Spirit came in, and He not only is like recreating you and regenerating you and giving you a new birth, but He's sealing you, and He's keeping you until Jesus comes back or until you die. And He's saying, listen, you're sealed. This is the guarantee of your salvation, the fact that the Spirit is there sealing you to make sure that you're going to make it. That's part of God's goodness. He teaches you. The promise of eternity with Him. All the Old Testament stories of of salvation look forward to God's ultimate salvation in Jesus, and He's given it to all of us. God has been good in salvation, but He's also been good in, in His guidance and His provision. Think about decisions that He helped you to make. 
Think about the direction that he gave you to go. In fact, there are many times where God allowed, like he directed everything to happen. You didn't even have to make the decision. God worked it out. That's a part of the, what's called the providence of God. God's overall care for his creation. Some of you were like, I've got to make a tough decision. And then God made it and worked it out. You didn't have to make the tough decision. I'm trying to stir you up to the goodness of God. Think about the food you get to eat. <laughs> hey, I went last night. Steph and I went. We went on a date. First time in how long? Long time. Months. Okay? That's what happens when you have kids. Just be careful. Went on a date. We, we tried to go to three different places to get dessert, and none of them had what we wanted. False advertisement. We were so mad. We, we weren't mad. We went, we finally we came back to Athens, and we went to cookout and got us a banana pudding milkshake. <laughs> best, best, hey, probably one of the best milkshakes I've ever had in my life. Okay? It's amazing. Look, like it had banana, like wafers in it. Like, oh, man. Good. Think about, think about the fact that you, God gives you, hey, there's, there's people all over the world that don't know where their next meal's coming from. And yet God gives you food to eat. He gives you water to drink and other things. Think about the healing God gives to you. Anybody been healed lately? Hey, I think that there are ways that God has healed us and saved us that we don't even know about. John Piper says that at one time in your life, God could be doing a thousand things in your life and you might be aware of three of them. Just think about how God has saved you and rescued you and delivered you. Think about the victories that God has given you. Success in life in some way. Temptation that you've been able to overcome. Just think about the change. I see it in, in a lot of you that I, as I look out, and I'm not going to point you out, but I see as I look because I know personally what's going on in your life, and I see some of you that I know that God has changed you, and you're different this year than you were last year because God has given you victory over things. Think about God's goodness in giving that, and this will be the refrain that echoes throughout eternity. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. And the chorus we're going to sing over and over and over is, For He is good, His faithful love endures forever. So let me, let me give you the application and then we'll be done. The application is actually found in verse 1 and verse 26. So let's look at it. Verse 1, he says, give thanks to the Lord. Verse 26, he says, give thanks to the God of heaven. The application, how you respond, is you now give thanks. Now let me explain that real quick and then we're done. This idea of giving thanks, this is very important. This idea of giving thanks is not to feel thanks. Okay? He's not saying be thankful. The word for give thanks there is actually at its root is a word that means to cast or to throw. So what he's saying here is not be thankful or feel thankful, but to throw out your thanks, to express it, to verbalize it, to make it known. So it's a, an expression of thanksgiving, not a feeling of thanksgiving, which is why they are responding to every line out loud verbally. When he says, he hurled Pharaoh and his army into the Red Sea. The whole congregation would say, and his faithful love endures forever. 
verbalizing it, making it known. What he's calling us to, you've got to get this, is a public profession and confession of thanksgiving. Now I can think of two areas with, of this pub, where this public confession of thanksgiving would exist. Okay? The two areas are in the church and in the world. It's really only two places, by the way. So in the church, the public confession of thanksgiving comes out in our worship. When people come into our church, or say any church, and you're there, and they look at you, or they look at us, do they get a sense of the goodness and greatness of God by listening to us worship? That's what he's saying. Our worship is not, and when I say worship, I don't just mean singing. I mean like the entire part of our response to God. That's what worship is. It's us responding to God. But when we respond to God, do people get a sense of, boy, those people are really grateful for how God has been good to them. Those people express how great God is. And they get a sense of just awe of God because worship is not about people seeing us, but when they see us, it's about their hearts and their minds being lifted toward God to see Him and His goodness and His greatness and His faithful love. So in worship, but in the world, the public confession of thanksgiving comes out in our witness. In the church, it comes out in our worship. In the world, it comes out in our witness. Listen, here's what he means by that, that we are so overflowing with thanksgiving and gratefulness to God that that comes out in our conversation with other people. Some of you are worried about your witness. Like, how do I witness to people? And I would say that if you will get close to Jesus, he will fill you with such love and gratitude to God that it will come out in the conversations you have. So, the response this morning is to take some time to give thanks to God. So, I just want to ask you to bow your heads for just a moment. And I want, you to, I want you to express, just right now, in a moment of prayer, a moment of response, I want you to just express your thanksgiving to the Lord. God reminded you of something, some reason to be thankful. Would you... Would you tell him, thank you this morning? And if, if you need to, to come forward to do that, then come forward and do that. If God has revealed to you this morning things that he's done in your life that you've not responded with faith and obedience and trust, then come and give your life to Christ. So I'm going to give you just a moment to express your thanksgiving to the Lord. And then we'll stand and we'll sing.
Father, I want to say thank you this morning for your goodness, for your faithful love to, to our church, for your leadership, for your redemption, your forgiveness. Lord, thank you for the things that you're doing among us, for the people who you have brought here to be a part of this family, for the salvation that you've given to so many in the recently, but just all of us who know you, thank you for saving us. Thank you for sending Jesus to die for us. Lord, I pray that you would help us to respond appropriately to you in our lives, to respond with thanksgiving, to let it come out in our worship and our witness. People would see through us and hear from us how good and great you are. We love you. We thank you and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to stand and we're going to sing a verse of this song. Many of you know it. And then after we sing it, we'll be done. Just as I am. be seated for just a moment. Take a moment in just the quietness to reflect on what God has said, and then we'll be dismissed. So, Lord, as we leave today, we simply say to you that we give thanks to you because you are good and your faithful love endures forever. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen. Before Cody comes to give us some announcements, uh, we're going to um, watch a video in just a moment, moment but I want to introduce you to the video. Um, during the month of December, we always give to something known as the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. And this, uh, this particular offering is in honor of, and you have a little thing in your bulletin about Lottie Moon and about the offering. And 100% of this offering goes to support international missionaries. And uh, we don't keep any of it. We send it, and it, it actually goes to them on the field. And so throughout the month of December, we're not going to take up one special offering for this, but throughout the month of December, we are going to be giving to this. And so last year, the way we did this was, as we gave our regular tithes and offerings, anything that was a surplus beyond our weekly needs we gave, we're not going to do that particular thing this year. So we're asking you as you pray and think about what God would have you to give, that you would actually uh, designate a portion of what you give to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering to go and to support that. Our goal as a church is $10,000. Last year, we set a goal of $10,000, and we ended up giving close to $20,000. Okay, so, um, hey, prove me wrong, all right? 
All right, blow that out of the water. But we're going to take up these, uh, we're going to have this available after each service uh, during the month of December, but we're also going to begin it at Thanksgiving. So our Thanksgiving meal next Sunday night, we are going to begin taking it up. And from there through December, and then also at uh, Christmas on the Hill, we're going to have these different opportunities for you to give to support international missions. And so I'm going to ask Drew to play the video and then Cody can come. So for the church, when, when I kind of had this idea of starting a church in a, in a gym, you know, people are like, what are you doing? So when we moved to Chiang Rai, we, we had to study language, and I was not a very good language learner, and I was stressed out. I had even told my wife in the, in the midst of that, I said, I'm ready to move, move back to America. I'm done living overseas. And so I heard about this gym uh, that was doing workouts. They had just opened five minutes from my house. I came and worked out, and I was exhausted. I went home, and I told my wife, I said, it's horrible. You should come too. Uh, and so she, she started coming. And so we saw the value in that and the community that was here. People love to come here. They love to hang out here. The gym was becoming a bridge from Thai culture into sharing the gospel and, and sharing Christ with people. And so I said, let's do church here. When we set up church, we set up boxes to sit on and we sat on these benches. We didn't have anything. We used the equipment that we had at the gym to do church. So the first day I met Nett, uh, he had come, he had, he had worked out, and I noticed the, the earring. He had a cross earring. After the workout, he asked me about my earring that I wear for like two, three years before I came to the gym. Like, oh, I like your earring. Are you a Christian? He goes, no, you know, it's just fashion. And so I was able to just share with him about, about Christ and what the cross actually meant. I have one day that I decide to go to church. The sermon is prodigal son. It's like... He's sitting there. He don't even talk about the thing that I have done to him. He give me the ring that I come back to be a shy. He accepted Christ that week within just a few days. He is the example that we have here at the gym of how Christ can change your life, of saying, God changed my life. I walked through these doors as a, a non-believer, somebody who didn't even know God, and he has completely changed my life, and he can do that for you too. Once again, 100% of what we take up will go to support international missions. Make sure that you are giving to this. Wonderful, wonderful opportunity to give, and we will start next Sunday night at our Thanksgiving meal. So make sure that you come prepared then to give, and to give every Sunday that follows. Um, and so continue to sign up for our Thanksgiving meal. I, I know we've got three pages full, but I know that's not everybody. Go ahead and sign up. Make sure that you're here. All you have to do is sign up and be here. We will cater that meal next Sunday night, and that will be at 6 p.m. So Thanksgiving meal next Sunday night at 6 p.m. Sign up. Make sure that you reserve your place to come. Immediately following that meal next Sunday, we'll be getting ready for Christmas. So if you are wanting to help decorate, this is your opportunity. We need your help to help decorate the sanctuary for Christmas next Sunday. Also next Sunday, lots happening next Sunday. Wow. Uh, Christmas shoe boxes are due. So if you've not done that, make sure that you get that done this week. Get those shoe boxes turned in next Sunday and bring them into the sanctuary. I'm sure we'll be praying over them and doing some different things. So make sure that you bring those shoe boxes next week. Uh, Christmas shoe boxes filled, not empty. Okay, bring them filled. Um, and then Christmas on the Hill. If you've not already signed up to perform, to perform, please do so. December the 8th, Christmas on the Hill. You don't want to miss that. Today we're going to end on a very special note. We always end on a special note, but... No more fitting with Justin's sermon this morning. It was beautifully done. And just if I can just comment on it just a little bit, what a wonderful time to have such a sermon to be thankful. 
we're rushing into this busy season of life. Let's stop and be thankful for the people and the things that God has given us and to be thankful for our salvation in Jesus. What a wonderful, wonderful message this morning. But today we get to be thankful and show our appreciation for two special individuals at Zion Hill. Uh, Jeff, been here a long time. He's about to Gary status since the beginning, right? 200 years? Sure. We're so thankful for Jeff. Uh, you can't say enough good about this man. So please give and show him how much we love and appreciate him. We are blessed to have Jeff and his abilities here at Zion Hill. And we're also very blessed to have welcomed uh, Pastor John and be able to love on him. If you've not got a chance to talk with Pastor John and just be around him, be in his presence. I love just being around him. So, I mean, just go up, talk to this guy. You will not meet a more humble, patient man on the face of this planet. So please show these men how much that you love them and appreciate them this morning. If I could have a couple of our guys to come and we're going to pass the bucket again. Once the bucket is passed you, you are free to go. So if we can have that come on up here. All right, some youth. There we go. Pastor John's taught them well. All right. All right, we're going to pray as they come up. Uh, and then once the bucket pass, you're free to go. Father, thank you so much for this wonderful time in your house. Thank you. Doing in our youth and his faithfulness to our youth, God. I pray that you bless these two men and bless their families. Wrap your hedge of protection around them, God. And, and God, I just give thanks for them and all that they do for Zion Hill. In your name, amen. Hey, Pastor Justin here. Just wanted to say thank you for joining us online for worship today. We hope that you are encouraged. If you feel like you need to make a decision, you have questions, or you just need prayer, you can get in touch with us by using the contact information on the screen. We also hope that you'll take the next step and you'll join us in person. Again, thank you for joining us today, and we hope to see you soon.